Mae West was a superstar at Paramount. And the Paramount gate that I'm looking at over there now, she kept that gate open many years. I wasn't a married man. I could go for you, baby. Oh, it's cracks now. She was very advanced for her time. Her stories were always had a risque, and she had some marvelous risque one-liners. And this, you must recall, was a, a time of very strict censorship in Hollywood. You ain't scared of me because you say I'm a bad man. I'm a good woman for a bad man. <laughs> she took this rather ordinary physical being. She wasn't particularly pretty. She didn't have a good figure by almost any standards. And she created this absolute goddess that was synonymous with sex and sex appeal for years. I shall die to make you happy. Oh, but she wouldn't be much use to me dead. She was all the sexy kind of women that you had heard about, but you never knew. She was funny about it, though. That was her saving grace. I'm sorry you think more of your diamonds than you do of your soul. I'm sorry you think more of my soul than you do of my diamonds. What excuse is a guy like you for running around single? born that way. We're intellectual opposites. What do you mean? Well, I'm intellectual and you're opposite. The character's name was Mae West. You could call her Diamond Lil, you could call her My Little Chickadee, you could call her whatever you wanted. She was still Mae West. Can we ask what types of men you prefer? Just two, domestic and foreign. <laughs> yes, sir. Won't you tell us where you're stopping during your visit here? Stopping at nothing. <laughs> Louise, and I had the privilege of working with Mae West, and I do mean privilege. I worked on her last film, Sex Tet, and take it from me, she was some kind of lady. Most everyone addressed her as Miss West, but the first day, I walked in and I said, oh, good morning, Mae. She smiled and she said, oh, is that what I sound like? And I said, oh. Yeah, you betcha, May. <laughs> she threw her head back and laughed. From then on, I called her May. To me, that was a gift. For six years, May West was one of Hollywood's biggest stars. May West, on her own, saved Paramount Pictures from bankruptcy. And while she was at it, she brought sex out of the closet. She made it fun. The way she walked, the way she sang, the way she dressed, and most of all, the way she delivered those lines. Single-handedly, Mae West changed show business and sex forever. Oh, honey, how's business? Fine. You been insulted lately? <laughs> Goodness, what beautiful diamond. Goodness had nothing to do with it, dearie. And with that one scene, Mae West became one of the biggest stars in Hollywood and certainly one of the most prominent stars here at Paramount. And for the next few years, Mae West was the biggest attraction Paramount had. She was a gold mine. Joey, Joey, well, well, come here and kiss me, you dog. Oh, oh, oh. Let's take a look at you. Well, you're looking great. Who's your tailor now? The first oh, film she went in to do at Paramount, she had read the script and didn't like it at all and told, uh, I guess it was Adolf Zucker who was running the suit at the time, well, I can do better than that, and went away and came back two or three days, days later with a whole new script, a whole new idea in the script, of which was the film they made. Everything that May did on the screen, the other people in the scenes had to fight for, for their presence because May had that tremendous dominance that when you looked at the screen, no matter how many people were there, you only looked at May and her movements and her dialogue. Sit down, dearie. Don't let me keep you up. Oh, waiter. Waiter. Yes, madame. A chair, you mug. May would have burned down the whole of records to hide her age, but the census roll shows she was born Mary Jane West on August 17th, 1893. The place, Brooklyn, New York, which was obvious every time she opened her mouth. The elevated train was already making distances shorter, but the city still depended on horses. 
May's father, John Patrick West, was nicknamed Battling Jack. He kept a livery stable in a tough neighborhood. He and Matilda West had two other children, Beverly and John Patrick II. But it was Mary Jane who was the center of her mother's life and dreams. That was her real name, Mary Jane West. And when you're born with kind of a Mary Jane quality, you want to maybe get out of that situation. As she said, I wanted to get out of being a little Mary Jane. My grandmother and Mae West had been girlhood chums, as she used to say. And I think they were originally attracted to each other because they were about the same age, and they both had the first name of Mary. And they both had interest in a lot of the same boys. Her mother had had her in child roles as Baby May in little stock productions around Brooklyn and Queens. She was made for the stage to be the focus of all eyes. Matilda believed this, and May was a very good pupil. She believed it too. Other kids might enjoy themselves at Coney Island. There were all manner of simple delights in those far off days but May stuck to the hard grind of the vaudeville circuit. At 15, she teamed up with a vaudevillian named Willie Hogan, and at only 17, she married Frank Wallace, a song and dance man with whom she had toured. But May's only marriage didn't last. They soon separated, and Frank was rarely ever mentioned again. But the May West we knew and loved was yet to be born. After the First World War, when vaudeville became a lot more risque, she realized that that was where she had to get her audience. If you did the juggling act, if you came out and did straight songs, that this was not going to get her anywhere. In fact, her early reviews um, say just that, that it, she's quite ordinary and a not very good voice and a not very beautiful woman. And so she tried everything. She dyed her hair red, she bleached her hair blonde, and started realizing that there were other entertainers at the top. Eva Tangway, who always did double entendre material and songs. Savoy and Brennan. Albert Savoy was a female impersonator. Say, do you know I met a fellow friend of yours this morning? How oh, uh, dare you talk to me? By the he wore eyes, hats that were twice as big as anything that was in fashion. And Bert's humor was very bold and very, very risque for the time. When Mae West started, Lillian Russell was doing her vaudeville act at the palace and around the world. The songs, songs about men, songs about uh, sexual happenings. And Mae West decided that she was going to do Lillian Russell in a totally different way. In 1911, Mae received rave reviews when she appeared in A La Broadway. The following year, she opened in the Broadway comedy, A Winsome Widow. She was soon revising her vaudeville skits to make them spicier. May enjoyed the reaction she provoked. She grew even bolder. In 1913, she opened in some time. By now, the senses were outraged. She did a dance which was derived from a dance she saw in Harlem called the Shimmy Sawabo. She did this dance with a number. It created a sensation. And it was her first really big recognition as a stage personality. The Schuberts wanted to label her the shimmy girl. And she said, no, no, it ha I, I don't want to be labeled like that. She said, I have to be labeled for something that's going to last a lot longer than a dance. World War I was over, and it was time to enjoy life. There were speakeasies. There was prohibition. The demon alcohol threatened the purity of the nation. Yeah. 
even greater was the threat of unfettered sex, and Mae West was its personification. There were other plays that opened and closed, and vaudeville tours. Reviewers invariably commented on May's sexy comedy style and flip dialogue. And then May West found a way to make sure she would not be forgotten. In 1926, May wrote a play under a pseudonym. It opened in New York. It was called Sex. It starred Mae West and was a box office hit. And none of the papers in New York would carry the ad. They didn't want to use the words S-E-X, the letters S-E-X. At first, the conservative reviewers savaged the play, but then the New York police did Mae West a favor. They closed the play for three days. She was put in jail. She went to jail on Governor's Island for 10 days because of this and she lived in jail like a princess. The warden and his wife took her out every evening for dinner and she said she had the best time of all. She talked about having gone to jail like it was a, um, like a medal of honor in a sense. She did deal with subjects that were not considered normal subjects for theater comedy then. Homosexuality, black-white relationships, things like that. When May's Diamond Lil opened in New York, it was 1928. May West had found the character she would play for the rest of her life, the bad girl with the heart of gold. The play was a smash hit. Four years later, May brought that bad girl to a silver screen that now had the ability to talk. Do you believe in love at first sight? Oh, I don't know, but it saves an awful lot of time. Are your glasses empty? No, no, I couldn't be. We had several sirens in the early days, as they called them, Pola Negra, Gloria Swanson, and they had the, the eyes and the whole thing, but a lot of that was silent. And then May came in with talking pictures, of course, in 1932, and her dialogue was very risque. She didn't care what she did or what she said, and it was always funny what she did and what she said. And the audience was always slightly titillated, a little bit shocked, and, and very laughed a lot. She knew how to write for herself. She was a wonderful writer for Mae West, and no one could quite write lines for her like she could night after night. She doesn't have the lead in that. That's the only film in which Mae West never got top billing. She was a secondary character in it, but she exploded on the screen. And honey, remember our last bout with champagne? Why, say, we got so plastered. <laughs> Why, they threw us out in the gutter. After she did Night After Night with George Raft, I remember George saying, Mae stole everything but the cameras. And of course, she also came with this reputation from New York, having done Diamond Lil and been this notorious woman that often got arrested or was threatened with arrest. And so people were rather suspicious of her in the first place, but of course that was very good for the box office. Like in one of her films, she said, uh, it's a man's world. She said, I happen to know how to play their game. You know, and that's, that was her attitude. When she went to Paramount, they offered her a salary. And her first question was, how much does Adolf Zucker make? He was the head of the studio. And they told her he was getting $250,000 a year. And they said, then I want $251,000. I want to be the highest paid person in the studio. A flood of mail came to the studio, all addressed to Mae West. The box office triumph of Night After Night convinced Paramount it had found a new star. Mae's contract did not only include the highest salary ever paid by the studio, she also demanded and was given full script approval. For her next film, May selected a story based on her play Diamond Lil. She did make one concession to the studio. She agreed to change the title. It became She Done Him Wrong. I wonder where my easy mind has gone. She discovered Cary Grant. 
when she was on her way to her car and Zucker was with her and they were about to get into her car and she saw this tall man and she said, who's the tall, dark and handsome gent? And he said, oh, it's an actor. He says, his contract expires. He's a bit player. She said, the guy can talk. He's my lead man. That's how Cary Grant truly became a star. I always did like a man in a uniform. That one fits you grand. I should come up sometimes, see me. I'm home every evening. Yeah, but I'm busy every evening. You know, I met your kind before. Why don't you come up sometime, huh? Well, I... Don't be afraid, I won't tell. But, uh... Come up, I'll tell your fortune. Ah, oh, you can be had. Cary Grant was in two of her pictures. And I think those two pictures established him as a motion picture star and one of our biggest attractions here at Paramount. Maybe I ain't got no soul. Oh, yes, you have. But you keep it hidden under a mask. You'll wake up and find it sometime. Haven't you ever met a man that can make you happy? Sure. Lots of times. Mae West had done it. She was 40. For six more years, she would be one of the top movie stars in America and around the world. And she did it by promoting an idea some still found shocking and even dangerous. Sex could be fun. Every feminine eye follows her dazzling gown. Every masculine eye, oh well, must we go into that? Hollywood in the 30s. The studio system was in its heyday, and the studios themselves were huge dream factories. For some, however, sex was turning those dreams into a nightmare. We must be on the lookout for scenes or action or dialogue which are likely to give offense. That's when the Hayes office came along, and uh, there was an actual censorship board then. The responsible men in this industry want no such pictures and will not allow these to be shown. It took years for Hollywood to ever get away from things such as even if a married couple was shown in a bedroom, they had to have double beds. If uh, uh, nobody could ever be on the, sit on the side of a bed if somebody was in the bed without their foot on the floor. We work with producers, authors, scenario writers to the end that our pictures may be the vital and wholesome entertainment we all want these to be. Can it be a cause? As May made more pictures for us here at Paramount, the censors became more dedicated to trying to subdue May West and to water down her dialogue. She told me this herself. She would write out her script and she would put all kinds of lines in it. That, that she knew the censors were going to cut because it got to the point where they wouldn't even let her film a, anything until they read the script. Uh, you were wonderful tonight. I'm always wonderful at night. <laughs> her sexuality all had to be done by, by suggestions, by innuendo. Uh, uh, nothing, uh, nothing as obvious or blatant as, as we can have today uh, in terms of what we were allowed to show on the screen in terms of the, of the human body and certain degrees of nakedness. Tonight you were especially good. Well, when I'm good, I'm very good. But when I'm bad, I'm better. <laughs> All they call me sister honky punk. I gotta swim now. She plays a, a hoochie dancer in a carnival. And because it's Mae West, you accept it. But it is really ludicrous under any situation that this woman of this size and this dimension would be hired by a carnival. Am I making myself clear, boys? According to May's script and according to uh, the Paramount film, all the guys sitting around watching Mae West were just uh, almost beside themselves because she was such a hot number. But I mean, that's, that's why it all worked, because you couldn't really take her seriously. As far as exuding sex, it was simply because she knew how to pull it off. She knew how to get those lines out there and just 
innuendo, like I said, and double entendre, and do this stuff and that stuff. That was the secret of Mae West. May West's impact on the American public showed itself in revealing ways. Curves were back in style, and so were the garments to keep them under control. I think if she had looked like Dietrich, or if she had looked like uh, Marilyn Monroe or something, I think she couldn't have gotten away perhaps with what she did. But I think one of the reasons she got away with it was because she was this rather oversized, almost matronly looking actual woman. Mae West certainly appealed to the men. And I don't believe that the women were intimidated by Mae West because they saw this bigger than life figure on the screen with the hourglass figure and all of the uh, risque dialogue that she had and the fun that she had in selling songs. And I think they were entertained by it. Oh, bring on those fancy loving poppers, you got a new one. Cause I just came from Missouri, I guess you know what that means. She was never a victim like many actresses of the day. She was, she was the one, Mae West, ran everything, personally and, and as a movie character. I think May was primarily fascinated and interested in men. I don't think she liked other women too much. Uh, uh, well, not for some exceptions. She, she, she did like my wife. Her father was a very strong and dominant uh, figure, and that was the world then. It was a, a patriarchy, not a matriarchy, and I think uh, May, in her own way, rather resented that. So I think she made a determination earlier on that she was not going to be found in the position of being uh, uh, subjected to the male dominance all through her life. And she established that early on and kept insisting and working on that and, uh, and fighting it all the way through. My old flame. I can't even think of his name. <laughs> let me tell you something. Don't ever let a man put anything over on you outside of an umbrella. Yeah. <laughs> she knew how to get a man to do things for her and how to be coquettish and bat her eyes around a cinematographer or a director and get them to do what she wanted them to do. She was the first liberated woman, really. I mean, when she came on with these lines and no one ever told her what to do or, or drug her around or pushed her down, she pushed in them. She told the men what to do and how to do it and when to do it and come up and see me sometime. And women loved that. I mean, they were tired of getting uh, the short end of the stick. I'm wild about you. Some of the wildest men make the best pets. Oh, Ruby, please. She okay. did not want an all-consuming love, though, in a sense. She preferred a rather light uh, romance. She didn't like a uh, person to take over any part of her life or demand anything from her. Uh, men who would come into her life were to realize that she was a free agent. And uh, they may not have the same freedom. No matter who you were, she had this routine. I mean, she'd start at the head and go down to the shoes and look at you and everything and say hello. You know, it was so calculated, but it worked. And you couldn't help but be fascinated by her because at that moment, she made you think you were the only man in the whole wide world anywhere. The sexual woman Mae West invented, and everyone watching Mae West saw the sexuality through Mae West's eyes. When she looked at a good-looking man, whether he be perfect or not, she believed him to be perfect, and she made that audience in the dark believe that that man was as attractive as he was. You're a dangerous woman. Thanks. You look good to me, too. Come here. She knew what worked for her. She knew how to manipulate everybody. She was her own best press agent. What's the matter? Are you afraid of me? I'm afraid of you? Yeah. I used to put my heart and soul in my dancing. May bought the Ravenswood. She lived there for 40 years. 
Everything in that apartment was white and gold. Mirrored walls. I'd flirt with a handsome man and ask them no questions. A nude statue of me on the piano. But now I'm a lady. Her bedroom, a round, circular bed. Up above, wall to wall, mirrors. And her answer to that was simply, well, I like to see how I'm doing. She became a multi-millionaires, not just by writing her screenplays, not just by appearing in her screenplays or her stage plays, but by buying property. But now I'm a lady, I've learned to be more polite. My name was called Anthony Quinn. She was dressed in white in this dingy office, but somehow she gave it a glamour. And as I entered the door, she reached over and she touched my muscle, my arm. She said, I'm not feeling you, boy. I just want to see what you're made of. Touched the other arm. She says, now, I'm going to get a little personal, because I want to know whether your legs can stand up. And felt my legs. I said, very good. How old are you? I wanted to lie, but I was 18. I said, I'm 20. She says, I'll use you sometime when you're 21. I walked out in a, in a dream. I mean, I, I met Mae West. I had been waiting for, oh, at least 45 minutes to an hour, and just sitting, perching on this chair in this white, white room, looking at all the white, white statues and pictures all of whom, of course, were Miss May. And finally, in came the lady herself. Very small she was, very tiny, much tinier than you expected her to be. And one day during a rehearsal, uh, the uh, leg of her uh, pant got caught on the edge of the sofa and it went way up. And I saw uh, the shoe. And the shoe was about nine inches or more high. So I came to realize that the Mae West walk was, in fact, a shuffle on stilts. I don't think she was over five feet tall. Probably. She made up that difference by wearing terribly high-heeled shoes, even platform shoes, and then piling her blonde hair way up on top. As she once put it, she said, it's not what I say, it's how I say it. It's not what I do, but how I do it, and how I say it when I do it. And that's it. Come here, Sonny. She was in a very filmy negligee. Her hair was very carefully done to look casual with ringlets hanging down. And she was on the arms of two of her muscle men. I think she had a whole retinue of them. And uh, she came in and said, uh, so what you want to see me about? And. Uh, and then she said, uh, you're a smoking man, aren't you? Someone loves me like that Dallas man. I found it very interesting, her background and the kind of lady she was. Uh, she was quite the, quite the opposite in many ways from the kind of sex pot or sexy lady that she portrayed on the screen. She didn't smoke, she didn't drink. And I asked her about this one. She said, well, you know, I haven't drunk since I was about 18. She said, I went out one night and I got a little tipsy and I came home, and I was very rude, not nice to my mother. And my mother just really took me down, and I was so embarrassed and so ashamed after that of what I'd done, being a little drunk, that I never have drunk again in my life. You're bound to lose, you're battle with fools, so stop and see what you're doing. Klondike you're Annie, she told me privately, was one of her favorites although she was very disappointed in the cutting of it. They cut scenes out, which were very important to it, but the censors at the time didn't want this or that. You'll never get anywhere because you don't know how to wrestle the devil. Tying a knot in his tail won't throw him on his back. 
You gotta grab him by the horns. You gotta know him, know his tricks. I know him, and how I know him. She never again uh, tried to uh, put any really dramatic acting into anything. She just stayed Mae West. Nice and cool this afternoon. Is it? I'm sorry I don't carry spare parts. But of course not. I wouldn't expect you to. And just take two steps forward, dear. Lovely. I always had a feeling that May was enjoying what she did on the screen just as much as the audience was enjoying watching her do it. And she always had a little sparkle. And when a scene was over, you could just see the smile on her face of satisfaction knowing that she did this scene the way she wanted it and the way she knew that the audience would, would accept it and like it. She was very protective of uh, her image. As far as photos, she did a thing with costumes that's very interesting. She had her figure put into the costumes in as much as the seams of the costume had a contour. She would put her thumb on that seam so that when the picture was taken and retouched, they would cut her figure into the seams of the dress which gave her a constant hourglass figure no matter what year it was or when it was done. Can I see you out for a gallop? Oh, it's these cobblestones that make me appear to be galloping. You ever take a ride in an automobile? It's quite an experience. Oh, I had lots. Autos? No. She could feel lights. She could tell where the heat was from a light. She could turn and just know that the shadow from her nose was not good because of that lamp up there. And we'd have to put another gel in. Her walk was calculated, her movements, everything was done. She knew when to walk up the stairs, and she'd say, hold it, and talk to the cameraman and say, your angle should be down farther. When I wiggle, I want it all to be seen. I think she had that typical kind of uh, tunnel vision that particularly those ladies have to have to become great stars. She was like her own invention. But I don't think I've ever met one, whether it was Betty Davis, Marlene Dietrich, uh, whoever, that didn't have total focus on themselves and how they presented themselves, how other people reacted to them, how they would seduce people. I met her at George Cukor's house, and he had one other house guest for dinner that night, Greta Garbo. And Garbo never got a word in, because Mae West did all the talking. I think she was probably one of the great ego people of all time. Uh, her favorite subject was uh, Mae West. I'm not sure she ever got out and smelled the flowers, or ever went out and had picnics in the park, or went sailing on the bay, or whatever. But. Obviously, those things weren't important to her, or she would have done them. She pretty much stayed in that apartment at the Ravenswood in Hollywood and uh, lived her life out as Mae West, playing this image that she had created. As far as regretting having children and things like that, no, no, Mae was not that kind of person. She was just, she was too, she was too unto herself. I don't think I ever saw the real Mae West, but I'm not sure I was the only one who never did. I think that the real Mae West was so highly covered by this actress playing Mae West, I'm not sure a real person still existed. On one occasion, I can remember we drove down Fifth Avenue, and I was with her, and we were in the back of the limousine. And the way she kept up with what were the current fashions was she was always looking in store windows. So we would get out, this would be around 11.30, midnight. My word, did I do that? Well, you're more or less responsible. Now get in there and do as I tell you. She says, you know, I feel like going out to shop. And I said, shopping? You can't shop now. Stores are closed. She says, no, 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 it's quite all right. I, I have my way of shopping. She would stop and she would look in the windows and see what the mannequins were wearing and what the colors were and the length of the dresses and this and that. And if anyone came along, the limousine, which was following very slowly behind, suddenly the back door flew open. She jumped in the back until whoever was on the street passed. Out. 
Say, hasn't this a slight touch of larceny? Larceny, nothing. You'll send him a check in the morning. Wow. Eventually, as it was inevitable, we heard sirens. And I knew they were coming for us. Well, the police did stop. They pushed both of us up against a wall. And uh, <laughs> I said, they said, what are you doing? And I said, uh, Miss West is shopping. They said, at this hour, with a flashlight? And I said, well, this is when she usually shops. By 1938, reviewers and audiences had begun to complain. Mae West's wonderful flip humor had lost some of its zing. Constant attacks by censors had left some of her best lines on the cutting room floor. Every Day's a Holiday was May's last film at Paramount, but in her six years there, she had left an indelible mark and a stronger studio. I stay. Is it? In 1940, the improbable happened. Mae West agreed to co-star with W.C. Fields. To future generations, it would be a magical partnership. Novelty's are notions. What kind of notions you got? You'd be surprised. But a cautious May had some conditions written into her contract. She demanded of the W.C. Fields if he was drunk, and her contract stated that he was to be ejected from the set. She always worked with very talented people. Uh, the one she didn't want to work with, of course, was W.C. Fields, and it was one of her most successful associations. There's something sweet and dainty about a lady's boudoir. How do you know? Why, the latest etiquette books are just full of such knowledge. Oh, for a second, I felt I had the vice of experience. She did not envision herself as a comedy character, per se, and she always preferred working with people like Cary Grant, Randolph Scott, uh, Warren William, you know, uh, handsomer, devilish men that she took seriously as leading men. So that's why she wasn't too keen about W.C. Fields. My Little Chickadee would eventually become Mae West's most popular film. But at first, reviewers were cool, and audiences were not exactly overjoyed to see their favorite Mae West become the butt of someone else's joke, especially if that someone was W.C. Fields. She always had good directors. She always had uh, the best production values. She did not go out at all in a second-rate vehicle. So the only time perhaps that happened was when she did a film called The Heat's On. But again, she was now at an age the war had come along, audiences were looking for the, you know, pinup girls, the Betty Grables and all of that. And that was a whole era later than May. These girls were all like 20 years younger than she was. Well, that's when she started concentrating on the stage. Mae West believed that one time she was Empress of Russia. She believed that she was Catherine the Great. So she wrote a play called Catherine Was Great. She began to toast to Broadway all over again. It was a comedy all about the Empress. And when the play was over, May invited the audience to go up on the stage, and the spotlight was still there, the, the wonderful spotlight that May needed so much was there, and she just handed out autographed pictures, you know, the postcard size pictures, and the audience, she never broke the illusion of who May West was, because May West was an institution. With her long platinum blonde curls, the world's premier stage siren also had the longest eyelashes. In 1948, May left for England where she opened in Diamond Lil. She was 55 now, but there was no let up in her plans for new productions and new plays, work, and being May West. Nothing else mattered. I, uh, I want to ask you a lot of rather intimate questions. First of all, what do you think of men? Men? <laughs> well, men are my career. Uh, May, tell me, what is your hobby? My hobby is men. <laughs> May, one thing I'd like to ask you, what, do, what is your definition of love? Love? Love is uh, what you make it and who you make it with. It can be a, uh, an art, a luxury, a physical culture. <laughs> May West, I want to ask you one thing. What is your greatest ambition? My greatest ambition? Well, if you come up and see me sometime, I'll let you know. Well, let's not waste any time. Let's go. She 
sailed over on the Queen Mary, was there in London, never went to Paris, never went to any of the European countries there. And I thought to myself, why would you go all that way and not go sightseeing at least? And, but May wasn't like that. Well, it was wonderful there in London, England. The men were terrific. They were a little reserved, and I'm not. She had adapted a play, Come On Up, Ring Twice, that enabled her to take Mae West to theaters across America. And there was always Diamond Lil to put on somewhere new. Her devoted companion, Jim Timoney, would be by her side to help it happen. But it was always up to May to make the final decisions. Marlena Dietrich was mentored by Joseph von Sternberg. Marilyn Monroe, she had her Johnny Hydes and her Lee Strasbergs. Whereas May, she was her own advisor. She knew what she was doing right when she started, and she never gave up. May West was a person whose philosophy was, you have a choice to be happy or to be sad, so why be sad? The only time did I ever see her even slightly sad. My mother and I were sitting around talking with her, and May watched my mother, and she put her finger between her teeth. And she says, you know, Kenny, I'd do the whole world, I'd give everything in the world, everything I have, if I had my mother back. When her mother passed away, Mae West's whole life crumbled. Only did she have the sweet spirits and the divine forces that kept her alive. Because she knew she could communicate, and many a night, sweet spirit, many a night, Mae West and I and a group of people either sat in my home or the Ravenswood and talked to the spirits. Mae West was very superstitious. She loved psychics. She loved fortune telling. And I walked out of her dressing room with her one day and there was a new penny on the sidewalk and she picked up. And she said, AC, this is a good luck penny and you want to be a producer. I want you to put this in your shoe and never be without it and wear it every day. And oh, 20 years later, when Paramount announced that they had made me a producer here at Paramount, the first call I got was from Mae West. And she said, AC, I told you, you wore that penny, and that penny did it. In 1954, Jim Timoney died. He had graduated from lover to devoted friend and helper. For months, Mae remained in total seclusion at the Ravenswood. And then she came out with a new idea. What better way for her public to experience Mae West than in the flesh? Not in a play this time, rather in a nightclub act where she would sing, move, and deliver her most memorable quips framed by a bevy of ardent bodybuilders. She said, we have something for the girls. Boys, boys, boys. She would undulate and move her face in such a way, but it was always like a, like she wasn't going to make an approach towards you or put her hand out at you, but kind of walk around you. And uh, we were all supposed to look at her with desire, but uh, she didn't feel that it should be overt. It should all be subtle. She didn't want a competing female line. That was also in Las Vegas, in, um, Hollywood, and in San Francisco, all the chorus lines were eliminated. In Diamond Lil, it was interesting. Um, in makeup, the actors, the girls, all had to have dark hair. They had to tone their teeth down so they didn't look too white. And there was some kind of an off-gray substance they could rub on their teeth. And May, of course, was blonde, beautiful smile, beautiful skin, and the girls also had to use a darker makeup. They couldn't use a light makeup. So that when she appeared, she truly looked angelic. Mae West has always given a lot of credit for having great courage to going out and doing the nightclub act with the muscle men and everything when she was in her 50s. But I'm not sure it was courage as much as desperation because she had no career in films at that point. They had been turned over to a much younger 
group of ladies, and uh, television was certainly not a uh, area that Mae West would have been welcomed into except as a kind of special guest star occasionally because people would be afraid she'd come in their living rooms and tarnish them because she always had this, this kind of notorious sexual image. She lived in the very center of Hollywood, though she was rarely seen around town. But her name was still listed in the phone book because what if a producer should need her? But she was a prisoner. She could not, outside of a small circle of friends, that she had for a long time, and also um, some like myself, a young, young boy, um, could be around her. Uh, because they would literally smother her and she had to perform, she had to be on. Uh, so that was extremely difficult. It was, she trapped herself. Mae West trapped herself into becoming a recluse. She was in this cocoon world. She was protected, of course, her bodyguard, and she was either in her apartment or in her limousine or in her restaurant, and there was always people with her to protect her, to help her. I remember going up one day, and as Paul let me in the door, she just comes right out of her bedroom, and she says, oh, how you doing, honey? And she comes close to me, and I kind of hug her a little, and she hugs me, and she says, oh, you're looking good. What have you done to yourself? And I said, well, nothing. She said, well, how old are you now? This was after I had left the Ravenswood. And I said, well, I'm uh, 34 at the time. That was quite a while ago. And uh, she said, well, honey, you look 24. You could pass for 24. Look at him. Paul, isn't he great? Doesn't he look great? And that, I mean, she was, that to me made my day. She was fab for Mae West to tell me I looked great. In the cast, Come On Up, Ring Twice, was a man who had been in her muscle show in Las Vegas, Paul Novak. He was absolutely devoted to her, adored her. He was, uh, at her beck and call, it was always, Miss West wants this, Miss West wants that. He was certainly a man who was easily 40 or more years younger than she, but he absolutely doted on her and she on him. Nobody else, even Garbo, had what Mae West had, the ability to live her life as you saw it on the screen in the character she had created. She was surrounded by glamour, her incredible wardrobe, and this turned me on as a nine-year-old child going to movies. And I said, I have got, simply got to be Mae West. And we were having a Halloween party. So I got my grandmother and uh, I said, come on, make me into Mae West. So she dug up an old dress. Uh, my aunt supplied the shoes. We got a spun glass wig, a gay 90s hat, and off I went to Thompson Junior School as Mae West clomping up the street in my Minnie Mouse shoes. Ladies and gentlemen, from one high heel step beyond, from the Twilight Zone, the return of Mae West. Mae was this flamboyant, extravagant, very special person. And when I walked on stage, she was instantly recognizable, and the audience just went bananas. I've always said that sex is a misdemeanor. The more you miss, the meaner you get. <laughs> sex is like bridge. If you don't have a good partner, you better have a good hand. She enjoyed people who impersonated her and went to see them quite often. She'd be very offended if any of the impersonators spoke or used foul language, because she felt that wasn't part of her. Now, I don't want your company. If you think you're coming up and I'm pouring tea, no, no. You People identified your... her with something naughty, and because she was so desperate for fame, she played on that naughtiness. She was a woman who spent her entire life grasping for the only kind of power a woman could have through her sex appeal. And that was true even in her 80s when she did Myra Breckenridge. I uh, was around the set of Myra Breckenridge quite a bit when she was making that with Rex Reed and Raquel Welch. And that was a very testy period for her. 
difficult period because she was coming back into the movie medium and she wanted to look good and she was a little old. Once, when she was working in Myra Breckenridge, she said, uh, what do you think of Raquel Welch? Do you think she's a good looking lady? And I said, yes, I think she's quite good looking, but she really isn't as good looking as you. That seemed to please her quite a bit. I remember one day she was auditioning muscle men in her dressing room. And she had a strange little dressing room that was pulled on to the set by two guys. And I remember we all sat around waiting for her to emerge from this little dressing room, wondering what was going on in there. But I, being a movie critic from the East Coast, um, always had more moxie than anybody else because I was never sure what the pecking order was. So I just walked up and I said, May, she had not asked me to call her Miss West, so I always called her May. And I said, May, what is going on in there? What are you, what were you doing? I'm really curious. She's, and she just looked at me and said, we weren't playing Scrabble. <clears throat> the end result was a little bit sad for me to watch because she took herself seriously. She thought the men were in love with her. She thought she was still a sex symbol. Didn't matter, she still stole the movie. Every scene she was in lit up when she was around because she just had that undefinable something that is really stardom. It separates the men from the boys and the real women from the kids. I mean, Mae West, whatever that was, she had it. May was 85 when she agreed to star in Sex Ted. She played a bride of 28. She insisted she had to be portrayed as the eternal Mae West, desired by every male in sight. Mae was very careful about how she looked and she took transparencies and if she did not like them, to make sure they would not be used, she would punch a hole in the face on the transparency, thereby rendering it useless. It was sad to see this terribly old, old lady going through it, not only in the finished product, but certainly on the set when she was working. She would often have to sit down when they had dance numbers that she was, you know, singing and dancers behind her. After Sextet, uh, when we got into her car, I said nothing about the film. She asked me nothing. The chauffeur was driving. I was sitting on the back seat with May, and uh, I just continued to look out the left side of the car. May was looking out the right side. We didn't talk to one another. I was determined not to talk about the film. Without any warning, she put her hand on mine, whereupon I turned to her, and she says, well, dear, that was yesterday. I've got to think about tomorrow. I'm not sure there was a real Mae West anymore. Whatever the girl was, this little girl that was three or four or five skipping along uh, streets before she invented this character that she became, I'm not sure she existed anymore after a while. I think Mae West as Cary Grant totally became Cary Grant. He was no longer a cockney little guy. He became Cary Grant in his real life. He grew into that role. He played it so often and so well. And I think that's what happened to Mae West. For women, she represented an individual who carved her niche every bloody way to the top of a profession that was run by men. And even if she was a cartoon, she still had power. And not too many women in the industry in those days had that kind of power. No man can support a wife and me at the same time. Someone's gonna get the short end of the deal, and honey, it's never me. What have you done to me? You're simply grand. What She glowed. She had an incandescence that was absolutely incredible. When she came on the screen, you couldn't look at anything else. You didn't want to look at anything else. She looked like a, a decorated wedding cake. She looked like a girl coming out of a cake at a party, all, but all dressed in fabulous gowns and furs and plumage and jewels. She made you happy. She made you laugh. She made you happy. She could make you cry, too. I've got my man. Now, step by step, I hit the top of the ladder. It was a dangerous climb. But now I'm a lady. Come up and see me sometime. She 
She can be imitated, but there was only one Mae West. Period. She only made 11 pictures, and the world laughed and loved Mae West. And she left a legacy. She influenced every sex goddess who came after her. Ah, but she still remains queen of them all. Oh, thank you, your majesty.